place. So this is Reese Garcia at Fight CRC. Uh, thank you all for listening in. Today we have Dr. Heather Leach and Dr. Elizabeth Ryan from Colorado State University joining us. Uh, they'll be discussing the effects of nutritional interventions and physical activity uh, regarding colorectal cancer. And after their presentation, um, we'll have time for questions. Uh, so with that said, I will hand it over to Dr. Leach and Dr. Ryan. All right. Trying to share the screen. I'm hoping that everybody can see the slides. Yep. Go. Sorry, I'm going to have to go back to the start of the presentation. Sorry about that delay. Okay. Can you only see the slides just to confirm? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for coming today. Um, we're looking forward to telling you about an ongoing study and some of the background and information before the study gets started. It's titled Beneficial, and it stands for Beans, Bran, Enriching Nutritional Eating for Intestinal Health and Colorectal Cancer, Including Activity for Longevity. And so Beneficial is going to be the acronym for the study that we're going to be talking about today. And so my name is Elizabeth Ryan, and I've been doing dietary interventions to improve gut health um, pretty much across the lifespan in everything from young infants to colorectal cancer. Hi everyone, I'm Heather. Um, I'm in the Department of Health and Exercise Science and my research area has been focused on physical activity um, for chronic disease populations. So how do we get people to engage in activity? Um, and as of recently, I focus um, a lot of my work on cancer survivors and in particular colorectal cancer. So in uh, my laboratory, this is Elizabeth again, the idea is that we've been working across a very large spectrum of small molecules coming from food, small molecules coming from different tissues in the body, and particularly from the microbes in the gut. And so we organize ourselves a little bit to look at molecules, but these molecules all function in different pathways and networks across different cell tissue types. And right now we've been, we're taking findings from animal studies and moving them into people. Um, but again, we really hope that some of the work we're doing and some of the foods we're talking about today have a global reach. And this is Heather again. So this, these are just some photos from um, my lab. So as you can see, we are on the very, very applied side. We work in, in humans 100%. Um, and really, these are pictures are very representative of our, some of our current studies. So um, looking at ways to um, get cancer survivors to engage in activity and using um, group-based activities, so how can we um, capitalize on the social support that they can receive from others who have been through um, similar situations um, to help them continue exercising, you know, after the duration of our intervention. So I'm going to give a little bit of background and talk about why we're doing this work. There was a very large cohort called the NIH AARP Diet and Health Study where they've been following people and this is when they were doing it for nine years. They're up to about 20 years, I believe, right now. And they were taking a look at their diet records and their incidences of various chronic diseases. And one of the major findings from this study was that fiber intake coming from whole grains and legumes, and this is more so than just fruits and vegetables, uh, lowered all-cause mortality. And what they wanted to break down was what soluble and insoluble fibers they were collecting information on. So you can see listed below, it just breaks up that there's different types of fiber, and I just want to clarify that whole grains and legumes are foods we're going to talk about, but they're definitely fruits and vegetables do provide fibers. But this was the first evidence um, to, to focus on these foods, which is why um, when you take a look at the whole population, hope our slides still advance. Um, they just looking at dry beans and whole grain intake. This is the percentage of adults, and this is from 2012, that actually meet daily recommendations. And so we can see 3% and less than 1% of people are making current recommendations for whole grains and legumes. So how we have a huge opportunity to increase that consumption um, through recommendations. 
there's a number of studies that have been done. So I'm just showing you here what different types of legumes are, such as lentils, late beans, pinto beans, um, lima beans, chickpeas. There's all different kinds, and I'll get into more detail about this. But the reality here is that there have been a number of studies completed already to show regulation of cholesterol and blood lipids. And this is important because even though consumption is still shown to be low, um, it's not about the, there being evidence for their health benefits. We really need to get people comfortable with eating increased amounts of food. And so we hope for colorectal cancer that the same thing will be true, that we can actually show effects, but also give practical means for them to adopt, um, adopt our recommendation. So the idea is, is not just healthy lifestyle behaviors or both physical activity and consumption of fiber-rich foods, such as whole grains and legumes. And we're hoping that it's not just about colorectal cancer, but there's a number of associated chronic diseases that um, we could see some benefits in. But, so the question next is, if you have some chronic inflammation, and particularly that stemming from the gut, um, we call gut permeability, this idea of having a leaky gut, changes occur in your in your blood plasma. So when you have a leaky gut, it's possible that there could be microbes and components from the gut that leak and cause more systemic inflammation. And many of the cancer gui prevention guidelines that I'm gonna show you next come from the data that shows how we can reduce chronic inflammation. So here's a list of guidelines from the American Institute of Cancer Research. And I've highlighted number four, but it's important I should probably highlight number two now as well in this particular talk. Um, but the idea is we want to consider increasing physical activity, we want to avoid sugary drinks, we want to increase these very specific foods, and then there's a whole list of things. And many of these have been shown to reduce inflammation and have various mechanisms. So we'll talk a little bit more detail of trying to get cancer survivors as well as uh, for primary prevention, people to adopt some of these uh, recommendations. I'm going to give a few examples of some work that we've done already here in Colorado. Healthy Hearts is a program that we've been working with children um, that have been identified at high risk for cardiovascular disease. We had a previous trial called Benefit, which is very similar to what we're talking about moving forward, but did not include the physical activity component before. We've also been working in grocery stores um, with public health folks to talk about how people can start incorporating some foods that we know have health benefits. So this is just, again, a landscape of some of the trials and ways we've been working to translate findings that we know are true from animal studies, um, but, but there's still plenty to do. And so now I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper into what legumes are, because I've shown you some evidence for them, and uh, we know that there's some misconceptions about the whole family, but really we're focused on this category in orange that's called pulses, and even under within pulses, the dry beans. So black beans, navy beans, red beans. Um, however, I just want to make it clear that legumes is a very large category of food. Another food type that um, falls under the whole grain focus has been from whole grain rice. And so I think it's important for people to understand that brown rice is considered a whole grain, but we often consume rice in its white form. And what's removed is the bran. And the rice bran itself um, is available to consume on its own without the rice, and then you're able to get more of it in when you're not consuming it in the whole uh, brown rice form. So our group's been studying the rice bran itself for quite a long time now, for over 10 years, and what we've done is we've reviewed all the different places that rice bran has been shown to be protective for cancer. And this is a pretty uh, detailed mechanistic slide but the reality is that we've shown you can reduce the proliferation and growth of cancer cells, you can modulate the immune system, you can have antioxidants from rice brands that are protective against inflammation and oxidative stress. And the mucosal protection refers to the gut, the ability of rice brands to help um, with microbes in the gut, as well as uh, to provide an immune response, protective immune response. And so this is just um, some of the specific mechanisms that come from a review paper. But we summarize the way we're thinking about this as lots of different foods come in their primary and secondary forms, meaning there's all kinds of phytochemicals, but there's also staple proteins, um, fats, and carbohydrates. And the, the gut microbiome is this new area of understanding for metabolism that can ultimately lead for gastrointestinal disease control prevention. And so this is holding true as a model because all foods are, are undergoing this type of metabolism by the microbiome. 
And so I was just going to spend a little time telling you about the previous study benefit that we did complete, where we first evaluated being able to get Colorado, um, colorectal cancer survivors in Colorado to increase their consumption of beans and rice bran. And we demonstrated this feasibility um, using meals and snacks, and we'll talk more about that later. But ultimately, we wanted to assess the effects of these foods on the gut microbiome. And we've had very, very um, positive findings that, in fact, by increasing consumption of these foods, you could, in fact, alter people's metabolism. So here's some background um, that brown rice itself, but as well as rice bran, has both been shown to reduce polyps in animals as well as in people. However, we haven't been able to get a good estimate of how much rice bran and beans different people have to eat because we are varied in our other diet conditions. And there's variability in physical activity and other things that we hadn't mentioned or measured previously. So I'm going to just say that there's information available online about benefit. That NCT number is a registered clinical trial number. So you can find more details about how we ran that study. But I think the main point is that we were able to um, reduce inflammation in these individuals in such a short period of time. And now we want to promote longer term consumption and evaluate uh, some of these other entities. So now, I'm, after I'm giving you all that diet background, I'm going to hand it over to Heather to, to take us through the next one. So after learning about um, these studies that Elizabeth had done um, with benefit, um, so why add physical activity? Um, so first of all, there's a lot of epidemiological evidence that physical activity can reduce not only the risk for developing colon cancer, but also reduces risk of recurrence and cancer-related mortality in people who um, have already been diagnosed with colon cancer. Um, and so we thought, well, that should probably be a good thing to add to some of these studies. Um, and further, we the link between um, exercise or physical activity and reduced cancer mortality is related to a lot of the same things that were being measured in benefit. So inflammation, cholesterol, and those kind of things that are affected by both diet and physical activity. So more specifically, people with high plasma endotoxins or other markers of inflammation are more likely to have um, polyps and be at higher risk for developing colon cancer or colorectal cancer. Um, and those also with high triglycerides or total cholesterol are also at risk for colorectal cancer. Conversely, those who engage in high amounts of physical activity have lower endotoxin concentrations and lower cholesterol. So we kind of put these links together and um, there's really only been one previous study that has established this direct link in colorectal cancer. So looking at a physical activity intervention, and this is very low contact, um, it was unsupervised, they gave people um, some brochures and followed up with them a couple times. So they found that it did increase physical activity in colorectal cancer survivors, and that this increase in physical activity resulted in subsequent decreases in some of these markers of inflammation that we've been talking about. So some really promising results, and, and we thought we should definitely be adding the physical activity component to, um, to benefit, to create beneficial. Um, so really, the, the overall goal of this new study of beneficial is to look at the associations between physical activity, the dietary fiber intake, specifically from rice bran and navy beans, um, and see what, what, um, what is going to happen to blood lipid profiles, plasma endotoxins, or other markers of inflammation following three months of incorporating this dietary intervention. So our, our goal for this study is to randomize participants either to a control control group, which will be a control powder, or a combination of rice bran and navy bean powder, um, which will be added into the study foods. And we have some, some cool pictures that we'll show you in a minute of those foods. Um, for the physical activity component, we're really not doing an intensive intervention yet, since this is still sort of preliminary. Um, we don't know what the interaction of the diet and physical activity will look like on these um, markers of inflammation and cholesterol and so forth. Um, so right now, we're just going to measure physical activity at baseline and post-intervention so we can explore these interactions. Um, and, and as sort of a, a, a measure of, you know, general care, all participants will receive some information about physical activity specifically for colorectal cancer prevention or treatment. Um, and some, some skills development from um, an exercise specialist in how they could potentially increase their physical activity. 
Um, so our, this is a pilot trial. So um, our goal for recruitment is 20 adults. And our inclusion criteria is fairly broad. Um, so people will have to have had at least one polyp removed or have been diagnosed with stage zero to two colorectal cancer within the last three years. Um, the only other things that would um, make people not eligible or exclude them from the study, um, we are excluding people who have had um, chemotherapy or radiation um, as part of their treatment for colorectal cancer. Um, we're excluding people who are pregnant or lactating or planning to become pregnant because we're not, we don't have clear evidence for um, what would happen um, with these foods for people who are pregnant. Um, no history of food allergies or major dietary restrictions since we are giving them um, steady foods. And of course, that they're actually willing to consume um, the foods that we provide them um, for three months. And so this is just kind of, a, this is a schematic of exactly what will happen in this study. Um, so our plan is to recruit people from um, previous participant lists, um, clinics around um, Fort Collins, um, we'll post flyers and brochures. We're, we're planning to do an advertisement in newspapers. Um, the participants will call us, um, or if we are given their contact information from a clinic, we will call them, um, screen them for all of those previously mentioned eligibility criteria, and then we'll bring them into their lab for their into the lab for their baseline visit. So at this very first visit is where we'll consent them to the study. We'll collect some information about health history, um, so any medical diagnoses, and kind of double confirm all of their eligibility. We'll measure their height and weight. We'll give them some questionnaires um, to assess some things that we think are related to physical activity behavior. Um, we will place an accelerometer on them. So this is an objective measure of physical activity. So this will be their baseline measure of physical activity. And then we'll provide them with um, a stool and urine collection kit. So once they leave that very first visit, we'll randomize them to either the intervention or control group. And then about a week later, they'll come back for the study visit one. Um, so at study visit one, we'll do a blood draw. So we're collecting um, blood at this is, again, their baseline um, blood draw. They'll give us back the accelerometer. Um, and then we'll provide, we'll do some, a few more measures, so waist circumference, sit to stand. Um, we'll give them their study foods, and this is when they will do their physical activity education session. From here, they are now in or started the intervention, the three month dietary intervention. Um, so, over those three months, we have the option um, people can opt to do blood, to give us blood or, um, every two weeks. Um, and every two weeks, they'll come back to the lab and we'll give them, we'll kind of um, replenish their food, um, food sources. Um, and then also uh, make sure that they're recording all of their um, all of their dietary intake um, throughout the study. So after the three months, they'll come back for the post-intervention visit, and here we'll kind of repeat all of the the baseline measures. We'll draw blood. We'll give them accelerometers again. Um, measure their waist circumference and their height and weight and all of those kind of things. Um, and so that's kind of the the basics of the flow through the study. So the intervention itself, we're going to spend a little bit of time to talk about how we can get people to consume rice bran and beans because on their own, as in its powder form, isn't it's, it's difficult to do and not always palatable. So what we did in benefit that we're going to apply here, we were studying the food separately. But the reality is rice bran and navy bean have distinct components that now we want to add together. So we've come up with a way for people to get 30 grams of rice bran and 30 grams of navy bean in study prepared foods. And each food is designed to have 10 of each. So we give people up to three foods uh, or three, two foods per day and then that way the powders that they have to incorporate. You still learn how to do it on your own, but it's not going to be the entire intervention. So the idea was how do we create a set of different kinds of meals and snacks that would fit a wide range of palates as well as not necessarily have such a rice bran or bean taste to them. And we find that was one barrier initially that people did not think they liked these foods. Once we started incorporating them into things like tomato basil soup or a smoothie or in a tuna cheddar bake, um, people realized and, and nobody knew in, in our other studies which groups they were in, we found zero complaints of any of the traditional flatulence or gas or bloating that you would typically hear of when people say they're going to increase their fiber intake. 
So that was extremely promising to continue to move forward with this approach as a way to get some of these foods into your system. And one of the things we noticed, though, and important to talk about this more broadly, is when we're evaluating the health benefits of just whole grains and legumes in the diet, I want to pay attention to this outer circle because there's different genetic selection and production practices for all kinds of foods. Every individual um, has different characteristics in their eating habits and as well as their lifestyle in general. The processing and preparation sometimes can influence the health benefits of foods and other meal components. How you, you know, when we pair foods together, we realize there's differences. So by controlling a third of the diet, right, it's not 100% of their intake, people in our studies are able to eat other foods other than what we provide them, but we do find that we still can evaluate what's been ingested, what's been absorbed, and what's bioavailable in, um, in the, when we test the blood, urine, as well as the stool. So that's the rationale. Um, in addition to providing food, stool, uh, excuse me, food and collecting samples, we also take dietary records. And these are standardized by the National Cancer Institute as a way for different trials to um, do dietary assessments. One of the things that comes from this ASA 24 is a healthy eating index, which is a good idea of the overall diet and how the addition of our foods could improve their overall intake to meet uh, the, the cancer prevention recommendation. And this is um, how we're actually measuring physical activity. So um, we're using an accelerometer, which is essentially the gold standard of physical activity measurement. Um, we're using a particular accelerometer called the ActivePal. Um, it's a small device. You can see on the, the little orange photo there. Um, it's placed on the anterior thigh, um, and it, it records information about your body's movement all day long, um, including when you sleep. Um, so we're, we asked participants to put this on at their first study visit. Um, it's attached to their leg with some um, tegaderm or kind of like a really sticky bandage. Um, and they don't necessarily need to take it off throughout the whole week. Um, some people find that if, if it gets sweaty or some water gets in there, they can replace the tankoderm. But for the most part, they just keep it on all the time for an entire week. And then, that, um, then when they bring it back, we um, sync it with our software and we'll get information about step cadence, which will tell us how often or how much of their day they were engaging in light, moderate, and vigorous um, intensity of physical activity as well as give us information about sedentary behavior, including distinguishing between sitting, standing, and lying down. So lots of really good information that we can get from the accelerometer. And as I mentioned, every person in the study, whether they're in the intervention or control group, will get um, a physical activity education session. Um, we're estimating the session will last about 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how conversational each participant is. Um, and this will be with an exercise science graduate student. Um, and we'll cover topics related to increasing physical activity. So things like what are the benefits for physical activity for colorectal cancer prevention or um, reducing risk of recurrence or mortality following diagnosis. Um, we'll talk about how they can actually increase their physical activity behavior through things like setting goals, um, self-monitoring or tracking their activities. Um, we'll address um, some of the things that might support their activity. So what kind of things are available in their, uh, in their environment, in their neighborhood, um, how they can utilize social support systems, um, and hopefully help them increase some of their activity throughout the intervention. So we have a number of expected results, um, but again, this has not been completed yet, but our goal is to see measurable changes in both the plasma and the urine using these markers, things like lipid profiles, endotoxin, the urinary 8-isophosphate next to alpha for, is an example of a marker of oxidative stress. So if we see changes in, over time in an individual, we can monitor how maybe the diet or the physical activity is influencing the oxidative stress in that individual. Our hypothesis, of course, is that we want to lower these things. We want to improve their lipid profiles. We want to lower these inflammatory and oxidative stress markers. And the idea is we need to also measure how much of the food and physical activity correlate with these findings. Because it may be that some individuals we see an effect and in others we don't, and maybe we need to increase the dose, or maybe they, don't, they just need a little bit longer time, that three months might not be enough time to measure um, these changes. So our long-term goal, and we have in 
review right now a couple of made larger grants to expand this trial beyond 20 participants. Uh, we find that we are going to ultimately need 100 plus individuals to complete the study, but one of the strategies that we use is to pilot it, make sure it's working and running in the way that we think um, could have some benefit before we try to scale up and include larger numbers of individuals. Right now, we are focused on Colorado, but it's very possible that we could eventually move into other sites with the same trial, and that's a long-term goal as well, is to, to run um, these studies at multiple sites. And then eventually, the long-term translation is that these become um, helpful practices that could be incorporated into the clinic setting as well. So I'm gonna leave with some sort of summary here about whole grains and legumes, that really it's, those are two foods, but healthy weight management, so including the physical activity component to achieve that healthy weight management, the long-term piece is reducing chronic disease. But around the circle are really all the different mechanisms that are important for physical activity and diet to work together to regulate these mechanisms so that we could see long-term prevention. Um, the challenge that we have is when people are already starting out with some presence of disease, maybe the intervention is going to need to be more aggressive um, to reduce their risk, but really primary prevention is the long-term goal. Individuals that are also known to have family risk is another subset that we could work with um, because these recommendations are very lifestyle based and do span across even genetic predisposition. And this is our last slide, but I want to share that this process of the scientific methods to advance work, so we start with hypotheses, you know, sometimes these mechanisms, what we call omics, are ways to look at different mechanisms of action for these foods, or in this case for physical activity as well. Um, typically when we're developing drugs, we use a very similar approach. Um, one of the things that's different here is the behavioral piece. So we can study metabolism, we can find effects of foods, but we want people to also be able to have um, healthy behavior changes and incorporate um, some of the recommendations at that stage. So the epidemiology and the translation to societal context, we really want to bring in some of those pieces earlier on in the clinical trial so that we, because a lot of the time, um, you may be able to do the clinical trial, show the effects, kind of something I talked about in the beginning, but then still not hit the behavior piece where people aren't able to adopt them. So our goal really is to see if we can work and blend some of those top um, elements of translating it, doing more of the surveillance, working on the behavior while we're studying what's happening with metabolism. And so that's all we have for today. We're happy to answer questions or engage in more discussion, um, or I'm happy to leave the slide up for now. Um, well, great. Thank you both so much. Um, that was extremely informative. So before I um, actually answer, ask a few questions, I just wanted to open up to Elaine and Kathy and see if either of you had any questions. Okay. Um, so one of my questions for you, um, is there a way, I guess, to control for what these subjects are drinking um, or take into account, for example, alcohol intake or control for that? Yes, that's a great question. So in our previous study, um, all our participants were limited to a maximum of one drink per day. Um, we did actually monitor that as part of the inclusion criteria that you were not allowed to have more than one drink a day because that is part of one of the recommendations. Um, so in this study moving forward, we found that for three months that is going to vary because um, but people do in their ASA 24 capture everything that they've eat, eaten and drank. So beverages are part of that. So we'll calculate that when we look at the healthy eating index, it will include beverages. Great. And so going back to that ASA then, um, if they're com completing the food record for three days each month, do you find that that's pretty indicative of their overall um, dietary habits? Yes, that's correct. So sorry, there's a... <laughs> In my office coming by. All right, so what we found with three-day food logs, and more so than um, the 24-hour recall, that if monitoring two days during the week and one day on the weekend is a very good representation of their overall intake. We do have a form where they have to monitor every day our foods that we provide to make sure that they get consumed, 
but yes, a three-day works great. 24-hour recalls in the ASA 24 are also shown to be very good, um, but I find that you need to do them more often. So we're doing one-week sampling at the beginning, the middle, and at the end. Great. And then I guess just one last question on my end. Um, if, if the findings from the study are promising, um, do you all have any intention of looking at um, this dietary uh, habits in healthy um, subjects for prevention? Is that something that would be maybe a next step? Yes, absolutely. So I think the right now it's very important to be clear that the recommendations for cancer prevention are the same whether you have had cancer or you have not yet had cancer. Right? So we want people to be adopting this and then not just be focused on cancer survivors per se. But the goal is to get people to adopt these and find ways that are feasible and manageable with everybody's, you know, different lifestyles and changing lifestyles as adults. Mm -hmm. Whether it's starting even as early, like I said, I work with adolescents and, and I think even in these high school years, some of these behaviors are becoming apparent very young and we can start establishing them younger. Um, but even in young adults as well. Awesome. Well, this work sounds very interesting, and we'd love to hear um, how it goes and the outcomes of um, the study and the participants and what you all find. So uh, if there's no more questions, thank you all for taking the time Reese, to teach us. Reese, yes. Reese uh, I have just a quick question. Sure. What is uh, dyslipidema? Dyslipidema, it was mentioned uh, earlier in the slide presentation. Yeah, dyslipidema is sort of a general term referring to um, sort of a not great um, cholesterol profile. So having high, high total cholesterol or high LDL cholesterol, so the bad cholesterol, and then low HDL cholesterol and high triglycerides. So having too much of the bad types of cholesterol and not enough of the good types of cholesterol. Yep. That's that's what my husband has, so I can tell him now. <laughs> Were there any other questions? Awesome. Well, thank you two both so much. Um, I will be getting this rec uh, recording over to YouTube, and I will send you the link uh, by the end of today. <clears throat> okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay. You too. Bye-bye.